First British Concorde, April 1969. Last British Concorde, April 1979. I've enjoyed working on the Concorde. You know, it's been a wonderful aircraft and one I wish we had many more to build. You know, cleaning it, we would like, it would be our dear wish to fly in it, wouldn't yeah. it? But because we'll have to wait to win the football before we can yes. achieve that wish. It is our dream. I came here back in 1966 working for an outside company. Uh, I saw the fabled Concorde and I had to go and touch it. And six months later, I was working with BAC. Two of the many thousands of workers who've helped to build Concorde are Wally Williams and Alan Radford. Here at Filton near Bristol, work on the prototypes began in the early 60s. And over the years since then, the workers have grown just as fond and just as proud of their aircraft as boat builders are of their ships. But now, Many Concorde workers feel that governments and airlines have let them down. Alan, who's an electrical supervisor, has been involved with Concorde for almost 20 years. His job requires scrupulous attention to detail. Everything has to be precisely right, everything has to be checked and counter-checked. Okay, I'm going to do an overspeed. Overspeed warning. Wonderful. Wally Williams is a mechanical supervisor, and he's concerned with structural matters. Air conditioning systems and so on have occupied him for nearly 15 years working on Concorde. As a supervisor, he's constantly checking other people's work, often in the most inaccessible places. Being a Franco-British aircraft, Concorde hasn't been built solely by British workers. Bonjour Jean-Pierre. Bonjour Alan. Ça va aujourd'hui? Ça va, merci. Et toi? Vous beaucoup de problèmes? There used to be a large French contingent, but most have now gone, leaving just Jean-Pierre Lego and his colleague to work on the engines for the last Concorde. Rolls-Royce engines, the best of British, with help from the French. Because Concorde was the first passenger aircraft to fly supersonically, her designers had to develop a mass of new machinery and new techniques. No existing engines could work on air at supersonic speed, for instance. And because of Concorde's wide range of operating speeds, from normal right up to twice the speed of sound, the air intake system to the engines had to be the most sophisticated ever built. Take him a bit more, Roger. Once fitted, the system is automatically controlled by mini computers. With the beautiful shape of Concorde, Technology has finally caught up with the schoolboys in exploiting the most aerodynamically effective form for rapid flight, the shape of the paper dart. But hidden underneath that shape is the mass of engineering which has to be put together by the workers. And the man responsible for combining all their efforts is assembly manager Freddie Price. We have in this country, once again, um, excelled ourselves in the technological field by producing an aircraft that no other country or nation has produced and we have here the Concorde in passenger airline service flying the Atlantic supersonic. We are saying um, this is the last aircraft but I think the thing to remember is that in 1990s, the mid 1990s, we should be flying faster and bigger supersonic aircraft. As we all know progress has never stopped from the time we had the motor car with someone with a red flag and, and now we you know what motor cars are today and that is the same with supersonic aircraft. You know, the, the field is still ahead of us for supersonic transport. Concorde's extremely long, fine nose is needed for maximum air penetration when flying supersonically. But it's the nose's ability to droop which has probably become the plane's most famous and endearing characteristic. Obviously, it wasn't made to do that in order to look charming, though. The variable geometry droop snoot was designed so that the pilot can lower the long nose and see where he's going when he's landing and taxiing. Even the men who built Concorde gather around in fascination when it's time to put that famous droopy nose through its paces. Hang on a couple of seconds then. And of course, the more moving parts you build into an aircraft, the more testing and checking the builders have to do. No other passenger plane ever needed a retractable visor like this to combine streamlining and a heat shield over the windscreen. But already the first British Concorde is a museum piece at Yeovilton Naval Museum. Alan remembers it with affection. 
Well, this, of course, was the, the first Old Smoky, the familiar name that everyone gave it because it was a bit of a coal burner. And uh, this, to me, is has got to be the best airplane I've ever worked on, actually, because it was the our future. This was what it was all about, the first off supersonic in the Western world. We knew at this time the Russians were going alongside of us, but um, they hadn't even got as far as we got. And this really is a nostalgic moment for me, climbing back on board a museum piece, as it is today. The very first aircraft I worked on and actually flew in. Museum curator Peter Jones found he had a lot to learn from Alan's reminiscences. What was your job when you were here? Back in these days, so many years ago, probably 12 or 13 years ago, I was a, an, an electrician, an aircraft electrician. And I remember lots of... Uh, problems we had, especially in a, an area like this, when we had to work behind it. Yes. Imagine trying to wire up in such a closed space, you know. It, um, it does really bring back lots of memories to me. Were they happy yes. memories? Very happy memories, yes. I had my first flight on this aircraft, and I remember coming from the back, still on the ascent head of Fairford, beckoned up by the first mm. observer here yes. to watch the Mach meter slowly creep round to Now, which Mach is that? Because I haven't had Mach much meter. time to see this yet. There's a Mach meter. Right, thank you. And to see that creep round to Mach 2, plus Mach 2, is, is so rewarding after having worked on it, you know? Did and you uh, celebrate the fact when you did? Oh, yes, yes. Celebrations oh. all round, hot coffee all round. You know, no champagne? Champagne uh, on some flights. Um, I would imagine that you have... A lot of people that say the concept of Concorde is, is quite different to what they're seeing here. Because yes, it is slightly unfortunate. The, uh, uh, the public uh, don't realise, uh, unless we tell them, and we try and make a point of telling them, that this is a research aircraft and not an airliner. So, yeah. It is not full of uh, seats and uh, glamorous stewardesses. It is a, a research workforce. aircraft, that's right. and that's it, and it looks yeah. like one. Mm. And uh, for the techni technically minded people, of course, this is first class. Yes, I'm sure it is. Even to me now, looking back over the years, there are so many things that are different. I remember with nostalgia, my job on night shift at Fairford, I used to have to fly this thing around the hangar with my inspector friend who sat where you are now. And we would have the time of our lives going through all the systems, trying to get the aircraft ready for rollout next morning. But it's so different to the, the present-day aircraft that even I would have problems finding things now, you know. It's all going back in time. Back in the early 70s, although Concord was being built at Filton, the test flights were all being done from Fairford, deep in the Gloucestershire countryside. This was where Brian Trubshaw and the other test pilots repeatedly put Concord through its paces and suggested modifications. And the man in charge of the ground crew, who had to get them done, overnight sometimes, was another Wally, oh, yes. Wally Chapman, now living in retirement uh, at Fairford. The uh, early team we had up here, of course, was the team that was supplied from the Filton factory. And they were up here for quite a considerable time, but when they, uh, people couldn't shift their houses, and it was essential to move people up here, I must admit that uh, taking on local labor and uh, people from other parts of the group who wanted to come up to Fairford here, it meant training them all again on, right. on an airplane like the Concorde, which wasn't easy, but uh, in the end, they, they settled down yeah. just as well as the, the, the previous team we got up here. That's right. And uh, I think that that's all credit to the... There are need for people like this in, uh, in most industries, I suppose. And this chap was Concorde 25 hours a day, without any doubt. Unfortunately, he demanded that from us at times, which led to upsets at home. In fact, the upsets in Alan's home life became so acute that he and his wife, June, began to think that their own marriage might be in danger of breaking up. I'm sure that the pressures on my wife, as they must have been with other Concorde workers' wives, were quite tremendous because we just got ourselves into a situation where we were at work all the time. There was, in the old uh, the words of the sailor, all work and no play sort of thing, you know. And uh, consequently, my wife must have suffered an awful lot bringing up the family, shopping and all that goes to general housekeeping, you know, on her own. We did have a crisis when he was in America and I was ill. 
and they thought it was quite serious at the time. And I didn't quite know what to do, so I phoned the secretary at Fairford and said, should he be told? And she said, oh, yes, definitely. And they cabled America and flew him back, which um, was very good of them. After all, expenses paid and so forth, and luckily it didn't turn out to be as serious as was suspected. But this is just one of the occasions when he was away, when he should have been home, as with lots of other times with little things with the children, and he was just never there. I'm sure they realised the pressures that they were asking from us all, but uh, it was a common bond, you know, from management down to the, the lowly shop cleaner. We were all involved, and uh, we just had to go along with it. We were just like one big tide. Still, there were happy times too, of course, at the old Red Cow in Bristol, for instance. Though even here, Concord vies with the local football team for attention.